polity. So today I'm taking a little break. I'm aware that all of you have your science and tech class scheduled at 4 p.m. I don't want to make things complicated for you. I want you to leave the class with the happy faces. So today's episode is dedicated to Citizenship Amendment Act. Many of you have reached out to me stating that you cannot form informed views on this. So I thought let's analyze CAA. At least to an extent that you can at least read the newspaper and form your own opinions. Of course, my analysis will be biased. It is still evolving. And I want to say this out loud that after my analysis, almost all of you will hate me. But still, I want to say this honestly, that I'll try to be as factual as possible. And I have said this again, and I will repeat this. Congress has not paid me at all. Their accounts are frozen. frozen. You know that. BJP is not paying me. More so now, you know, the, the electoral bond issue. How can they make, how can they make payments? We'll come to scrutinize. So I don't know if Arvind Kejriwal has money. So we are, we will try to be as unbiased as possible and not paid by anyone, sadly. The discussions around CAA is not what BJP government initiated. This has been a point of discussion even before the first BJP associated government was formed in the 1990s. So not, not everything is current affairs. It's been in discussion for a long, long time. But we'll start today's video with a video that's going viral. We'll start today's episode with a video that's going viral. It's a video of Abhinav Chandrachur going viral. How many of you have seen that video so far? He's articulate, and why not? He would have taken negotiation classes at Harvard. I also attended one of the sessions at the HLS, the Harvard Law School. Harvard allows you to cross-register across schools. If, you can, if you're in business school, you can take classes in the Kennedy. If you're in Kennedy, you can enroll in the law school for a few credits, not for the entire course. Anyway, let's analyze what Abhinav Chandrachul has to say because his speech is going viral. And from here on, we'll see what is CAA. Act as it stands today is unconstitutional. However, I do believe that a compelling argument can be made that the Citizenship Amendment Act as it stands today is unconstitutional because of Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, which grants to every person, not merely every citizen, the right to equality and the equal protection of the laws within the territories of India. And there are four or five reasons really why one could argue that the Citizenship Amendment Act is unconstitutional because it violates the equality provisions of the Indian Constitution. I'm sure many of you have heard those arguments already. One of the arguments is that it excludes certain categories of religious groups. It excludes Jews. I'm not able to understand why Jews have been left out from the Citizenship Amendment Act. And on social media, when I posted a paper that I'd written, somebody said, well, Jews have Israel. Okay. But we have one of my very good friends is a Jew in Calcutta. Jews also have India. And if Jews have Israel, then Christians and Buddhists have their own countries too. We've included Christians and Buddhists, but we've left out Jews. That doesn't make sense to me. What about Baha'is? Baha'is have no country of their own. We've left out Baha'is. You've left out atheists, people who believe that there is no God. Blasphemy attracts the death penalty. It is blasphemous to say that there is no God. <laughs> You've excluded people who don't know if there's a God or not. Agnostics, people who are doubtful about whether there's a God or not. You've left out categories of Muslims who may be considered minorities in countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Categories like Ahmadiyas or Hazaris. 
Okay, anyone has any thoughts around this? How many of you are in agreement of this? Let's put a structure to it. Those who are in agreement of this. Anand, what a surprise. You're in agreement of this? No. And raised his hand. Okay. Tabish, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, so I come in full concurrence with what he just said, that uh, it's not just Muslims who are excluded, it's the Jews also. And uh, the second is, uh, if it is based on the persecution, I think uh, Tariq Fateh and Taslim and Asri, these two are those people who are persecuted in their own countries. So if they seek for citizenship based on this, they won't get it because Muslims are excluded and they are Muslims. So I think this is un un unconstitutional, just like uh, Chandra Chul said. Okay. Sahil. Uh, adding to what Tabish has said, and uh, Chandra Chul has slightly mentioned that it is it violates the Article 14 of the Constitution because it is available to to all the citizens, all the people who are living in uh, in the territory of India. So this is something which is one okay. of the main point as well. Okay. Man, you all are going to hate me, but still fine. We'll talk. See, Abhinav is the son of the Chief Justice of India. And he's very articulate. But for the next 45 minutes, I want all of you to get rid of all your political biases. See, I've said this in the past. We are not the spokesperson of BJP. We are not the spokesperson of Congress. Accounts are frozen. We are the spokesperson of India. These political parties will come and go. The narratives will come and go. But this beautiful country of India will remain forever. It has to remain forever. So today's class is dedicated to India. It's a small hiatus from Article 13 and 14. We'll come to it. And we'll have a lot of fun when we discuss it because I'm going to quote a lot of examples from CAA. I've spoken at length criticizing BJP. I've done the same for Congress. And we are not here to dole out labels for anyone. Just be factually correct in our understanding. So Abhinav says that Citizenship Amendment Act, as it stands today, it is unconstitutional. So what's the reason? One of the reasons mentioned is that, and Abhinav is absolutely correct when he says that Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, he says that Article 14 grants to every person, not merely every citizen, the right to equality. I'm just quoting him. So it does not matter whether you are an Indian or American. If you are residing in India, the fundamental right of Article 14 is applicable to you. And he's absolutely right there. Unlike the other rights that are enjoyed exclusively by Indian citizens, such as Article 15, 16, 19, 29, 30, Article 14 is enjoyed by non-citizens also. So Abhinav is fine. Nothing wrong with that. Very well said. And I think that statement was also cheered by the audience. Print, Barkha Dathji, they all the media organizations are reporting this, including Al Jazeera. But let's analyze what he is saying. First and foremost, it is to be duly noted that Jews, Ahmadiyya, Baha'i, they are all eligible even today to become India citizens. There's nothing in the CAA that says that Ahmadiyyas or Baha'is or Jews, they cannot become citizens of India. The only difference is they have to apply via traditional path under the Citizenship Act. Adran Sami was a Pakistani citizen. Adran Sami was a Muslim. And he became citizen of India. How? Because India is not a banana republic. As Al Jazeera may portray it to be. Of course, there are many problems in India. And these problems are not just restricted to India. Across the world, countries have issues with their governance, politics, and whatnot. Just look at America, UK, 
mere existence of problems does not make india a banana republic ahmadiyas bahai jews these groups are not barred from applying from to indian citizenship as wrongly portrayed by al jazeera and many such media outlets shamelessly they can still become indian citizen via traditional route available under the indian citizenship act of 1955 via the process of naturalization if you don't believe me just look at this this is a youtube feed of one of the unbiased media outlet anti muslim citizenship law two days ago protest against citizenship law 18 hours ago anti muslim citizenship law india kerala go on and on hindu nationalism Adnan Sami was a Pakistani citizen. Adnan Sami was a Muslim. He was granted Indian citizenship on first January twenty sixteen. He obtained it via naturalization process. We can talk about it. What is this naturalization process? How is it different from the other processes? The only difference is that he cannot be made a citizen via fast track process through the CAA. But why? What is CAA? enacted in december 2019 of course it has many provisions but one of the critical provisions is that it reduces the residency requirements for certain religious minorities from three neighboring countries which are those minorities if you are a hindu sikh buddhist jain parsi christian from these three neighboring countries pakistan afghanistan and bangladesh then the required period of residency in india for you will not be 11 years it can be i think 6 years before the enactment of the caa the general requirement for citizenship by naturalization was that applicant must have lived in india for 11 years out of 14 years immediately before the year of application but now caa has reduced this requirement for certain minorities religious minorities from afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan but now the question is what is the problem why are people against it logically it makes a lot of sense in countries like pakistan bangladesh afghanistan these countries are islamic republics there are ample empirical evidences to prove that the unfathomable atrocities on the religious minorities there of course algeria will not talk about that but let's talk about it pakistan has blasphemy laws there are numerous instances when minorities such as christians hindus they have been falsely implicated under blasphemy lynched hanged murdered and i will quote reports from the foundations the aurat foundation the movement for solidarity and peace they have estimated in their reports in detail that every year 1000 women approximately 1000 women and girls from minority christian and hindu communities they are abducted and forcefully converted to islam not just that they are also married off to their abductors that has happened my organization the un it has expressed concerns over the rise in kidnapping conversions forced marriages of girls and young women from religious minorities in pakistan while it's international human rights law therefore they have a detailed report on this just read through the official website i know algeria is silent because look at their donors in fact there are court cases court verdicts in pakistan that have enabled these offenses pakistan is not alone bangladesh also has systemic economic marginalization of hindu community in bangladesh the vested property act that they have it has been used to to dispose hindus of their land and property there have been innumerable instances in bangladesh where hindu temples hindu homes hindu properties they were vandalized destroyed and how can you forget afghanistan 
especially in the days and age of Taliban, Sikhs, the Hindus over there, they are struggling immensely. Sikhs and Hindus, they have faced direct persecutions ever since Taliban came to power. The resurgence of this Taliban has led to exodus of Sikhs and Hindus from Afghanistan. So according to the law, let's get rid of politics. I know it's a controversial time to introduce this act, but let's just analyze the act. India wants to stand strong with these religious minorities. So what's wrong with that? What's the problem? Why is Abhinav Chandrachur, who will potentially go on to become India's chief justice in future, why is he saying that a compelling argument could be made that CAA is unconstitutional, violative of Article 14? See, whether you like it or not, he will go on to become Chief Justice of India. His father is the current Chief Justice of India. His grandfather was the Chief Justice of India. I'm laying out facts. There should be no contempt of court when I say this. He's exceptionally talented, like his father. He's also a Harvard graduate, like his father. Extremely well-read, like his father and grandfather. So he has access to phenomenal education, phenomenal internships, and then, of course, important, relevant cases. And when your father is a high court judge, a Supreme Court judge, you will be given a lot of opportunities in the same field. And you should be given. Why not? If you were to become a Chief Justice of India, you will also do this for your kids. Judiciary is not alone. Something similar happens in other fields also. Our Honorable Home Minister, he also has a very talented son who is now heading BCCI. His impeccable credentials plays very well. Cricket, not politics. Manages businesses very well. Yeah, Rahul Gandhi ji, another talented individual. Just think for a second if Rahul Gandhi ji, if he was not from Nehru Gandhi dynasty, what would he be doing today? He scored 61% in class 12th. Unlike Shatakshi, who had to top her class 12th, who had to clear St. Stephen's interviews to get into St. Stephen's, Rahul Gandhi ji did not to worry about all that nonsense. Even with 61%, he got into St. Stephen's. Why? Because he had an exceptional hidden talent. That talent is not bloodline. Don't. I'm not saying that. He was a support, he was a sports star. He used to play very good sports. He got into St. Stephen's with 61% using a sports quota. I wish he had represented India in Olympics or Commonwealth Games or Asian Games. But he's kind-hearted. He would have given opportunities to others so that they can represent India. The way he is giving even today. By the way, it's not... I hope you all get it sarcasm. I think it's a shame that India does not have a credible opposition leader. It's devastating for a democracy. In judiciary, there is a dynastic trend. In politics, there is a dynastic trend. In business, there is a dynastic trend. Just a few families controlling 90% of India's wealth. In a way, running India. 10 people run India today. That's it. In Bollywood, there is a dynastic trend. Only on the YouTube comment section, there is democracy. And this is not BJP versus Congress. BJP is also becoming a dynasty. Amit Shah's son, Rajana Singh's son, Vasundra Raja Sindhya's son, Sushma Swaraj's daughter. I can guarantee they all will run for elections from BJP ticket. Same story with Congress. Same story with Samajwadi Party. Samajwadi party, Samajwad, what is it? Socialism. It's a family business now in UP. Anyway, coming back to Abhinav Chandrachur. Why is he saying that CAA is violative of Article 14? Just because CAA excludes Ahmadiyas from getting the benefits of accelerated path to become India's citizen, can we say it's violated by Article 14? So first and foremost, Ahmadiyas can still become India's citizens. They just have to follow the traditional route available under the Indian 
Citizenship Act of 1955. But let's talk about Ahmadiyas. Why should Ahmadiyas of Pakistan be given religious asylum in India? How ludicrous would that be? Because if you go back in the history of the creation of India, division of India, partition of India, Ahmadiyas were amongst the leading founding communities of Pakistan. Muhammad Zafarullah Khan, a prominent Ahmadiyya, he played a significant role in the Pakistan movement. He was an Ahmadiyya who was making case for Pakistan and international platforms to create a state based on religion. Leading Ahmadiyyas just go through the Lahore Resolution of 1940. The same resolution that called for the establishment of independent states for Muslims. All the Ahmadiyyas they supported the resolution. A resolution that laid the groundwork for the creation of Pakistan. Not just this, the first foreign minister of Pakistan was an Ahmadiyya. Same Ahmadiyya who spoke at length criticizing India on Kashmir issues in the UN. Ahmadiyyas they contributed to the drafting of Pakistan's Declaration of Independence. Ahmadiyyas were involved in the drafting of the Objectives Resolution. A resolution that laid down the principles of their own version of their own Islamic Republic. And why should India have any obligation to support a community that betrayed it by providing them an accelerated pathway to become citizens of India? It's a fact. How many Ahmadiyyas have stood up in support of Hindus and Sikhs? were persecuted in Afghanistan, in their own Pakistan. But there are evidences that they stood up against the atrocities of Kashmir against India while being Pakistani citizens. So I don't understand why excluding them from granting expedite citizenship makes it unconstitutional because they still constitutionally become part of India. If they can reside here for 11 years, follow the rules, regulations, and apply accordingly. Abhinav is saying that why exclude Jews or atheists or agnostics? Very good point around Jews, atheists, agnostics. Now my question is how do you, how do you classify atheists or agnostics within the framework that is designed to address religious persecution? persecution? I will come to Jews in some time, but let's talk about atheists and agnostics. Because there was a huge round of applause for these points. How do you do that? If you were a policy maker in any capacity involved in drafting this bill, how do you identify atheists and agnostics? What if in future, you know, India has a precarious border and find these three countries. What if terrorists send across their sons and daughters, extended relatives to India, falsely declaring themselves to be atheist agnostics, gain India become India citizen? Why not include other Muslims? Pakistan, Afghanistan, these are Islamic republics. What sense does it make to put them in that list? And they can still become Indian citizen, just not via expedited process. Why aren't we including Jews? That's a very interesting question. And here I would want to analyze this through the lens of diplomacy. India has historically maintained a nuanced stance in Middle Eastern geographies, where we want to foster closer ties with both Israel and Arab world. We have good ties, by the way, with Saudi Arabia, perhaps looking better than what Pakistan has today. Including Jews in the, including these uh, Jews in the CAA could be perceived as favoring Israel over its majority Muslim neighbors. May perhaps potentially complicate India's relations with countries in the Islamic world. And today, whether you like it or not, India has 
a lot of significant economic and strategic ties with those countries. CAA focuses on minorities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And there is a reason for it. Because there have been significant evidences, reports, studies on the scene, published not by just the NGOs based in Pakistan, but also by the UN. Of course, we can say UN is also nonsense, but some institution needs to be looked at impartially. Al Jazeera is not always correct. There has been instances, history of religious persecutions of Hindus, Sikhs, Christians in those lands. CAA is designed to address the historical migration patterns where these communities have migrated to India in large numbers due to persecution. Do we have substantial evidence for Jewish population facing persecution in these countries in the last 40 years, 30 years? No. Because many Jews have already migrated to Israel or other countries over the decades. Israel has always had that law of return, allowing any Jew from across the world to settle in Israel, obtain their citizenship. Tomorrow I can wake up and say that India should also include Scientologists. And Tom Cruise follows that religion. Or Native American religions. Or Shinto in the CAA. Why haven't they included Shinto in CAA? Shinto is a traditional religion of Japan. So there is no end to this debate. Because we are overtly complicating practical realities with theory. Just to frame arguments and fighting amongst them ourselves. Al Jazeera is showing to its 13 million people across the globe, I mean, based on their YouTube following, that India is implementing anti-Muslim citizenship law. But is CAA mentioning anywhere that Muslims cannot become Indian citizens? You can. Jews can also become. Shintus can also become. India has never expelled refugees to countries where they faced serious threats to their life of freedom. India has always adhered to the principle of non refoulement We'll talk about this in time to come.